I was born right here in Nashville, Tennessee in 1938 at St. Thomas Hospital and used to be on Hayes Street. It was a wonderful time. Easy, pleasant, comfortable. Kids would get together. We played football mostly, boys and girls. And we played Army during World War II. I lived for the first 14 years of my life without uh, running water. Uh, would have been considered very poor. I remember coming to Nashville once or twice a year to shop. So I grew up with that picture in my mind of downtown Nashville, the bustle and, and the surge of, of people in the streets. A vegetable wagon with fresh fruits and vegetables would come up and down the streets. Murfreesboro was small then. You didn't have to lock your doors or anything like that. We had an all-white church, and the schools were segregated, of course. You still had the, the signs at the courthouse, whites only, colored only. I can remember the nuns taking us down to the old Paramount Theater to see the Ten Commandments, and the manager would not let the black girls sit with us in the theater, made them sit upstairs. Everything was segregated. Nobody questioned it. Uh, in the small country circle that I lived in, this was the way life was. And it appeared to be that way when we went to larger places like Nashville. Segregation was the southern way of life. It's relatively easy on race. Um, you know what the discrimination was. You know what the prejudice was. But if you look at the textbooks, there is no place uh, that as a child, as a young adult, you are required to or given the opportunity to consider an alternative lifestyle. You aren't asked to address it at all. And I think back on adults I knew who were different in their mannerisms or in uh, maybe even in uh, little uh, expressions or gestures in private that uh, I couldn't interpret then. I just, I treated what we now would call a gay or homosexual appearance the same way uh, we treated uh, segregation. We just didn't talk about it. In Hartsfield, Tennessee, people didn't know. I mean, they had no, I don't know that they had ever heard about homosexuality. You have to understand the depth of the of repression that not only I grew up in, in the mountains of Kentucky, but that existed also at Vanderbilt, not in terms of official re repression, but the subtle repression. The parents I had, but particularly my mother, who was from an elite family. One of the things I'll always remember about my mother is it isn't done. And once she said that, that was it. I guarantee you we didn't say homosexual nor lesbian. That sounded like uh, uh, words you should never say. Gay meant you were happy. I never heard the word gay used in any context except that until much, much later in my life. Homosexual, queer, derogatory terms like uh, uh, sissy, those terms you would hear. They talked about queers and did things like this, you know. That meant you were queer, a limp wrist. The adjectives applied uh, always were pejoratives. They were negatives. Um, yeah, the word deviant. Um, um, queer. There was a known lesbian on the street that everybody was supposed to avoid. They didn't call her a lesbian, they just said she was that way. 
I remember being in the, the sixth grade and there was a big meeting at the house and I couldn't understand what was going on. And it all ended up that he, this guy went to church because church was a big part of our lives and had to ask, every, tell everybody he sinned and ask everybody for forgiveness. And I kept saying, what did he do? What did he do? And uh, my dad said, oh, he was just one of those sweet boys. He was not dating girls. I used to wonder why I was like I was. I wasn't like any of my brothers. And uh, I used to kind of believe that I was, that they'd taken the wrong baby home from the hospital. And no one ever called me queer, but I was considered the county's artist. <laughs> my mother had a wonderful chenille bathrobe and um, it was real full. Of course, I was small too, and I would, put it on with some brown high heels and uh, twirl on the back porch. <laughs> I was a mama's boy, I was under her feet. I liked the ballet and the opera and rhinestones and feathers and furs. And uh, I don't think I ever wanted to be a woman. I wanted to be just what I was. The first time I ever thought I had feelings for a woman uh, or a girl, I mean, I wasn't but 12 then and we were standing on the stairway going down to lunch. And all of a sudden, I looked at this little girl and I thought, ooh, she's beautiful. <laughs> I feel just the same about her as the boys do. <laughs> My experiences in junior high school on the playground were <clears throat> a little bit uh, uh, traumatic, I would say. <laughs> I didn't even know how to hold a bat when we moved inside to play basketball or dodgeball in gym. Uh, I was the target of a whole lot of very swiftly thrown balls. <laughs> but I was not able to, to uh, dodge. I made a mistake one time. I was in the library tracing some paper dolls. And this guy walked up to me and says, what are you doing? And I looked up and I says, I'm drawing some paper dolls for another girl. Well, that followed me through school. Every day somebody would bring that up. Are you drawing any paper dolls for another girl today? And I thought, I wished I hadn't said that. In school, you know, I was called sissy, but it just hurt my feelings, something awful. I had one teacher explained to me that I was born female. She understood. I think my dad was very worried about me. And I think perhaps that's understandable. There was no such, they certainly knew nothing about transsexuality or transgender any of that. There were no gender issues. So daddy sent me off to play with neighborhood boys. And I suppose the idea that was that I would uh, pick up masculine traits. I don't know how to put this otherwise, but the only thing that happened is, well, I do know how to put it. They would want to play cowboys and I would say I won't play unless I'm the cowgirl. And they showed me what cowboys do to cowgirls. I don't know why they picked me out. I don't know if I was, if I was, uh, uh, what you call effeminate. Uh, a person called me and asked me to come over to their house to work on a project. And uh, he was uh, very popular in school. And I thought, why is he calling me? And uh, so I went over there very innocently, and uh, he approached me and started playing around with me. And uh, I thought, my problem was that I didn't back away. And after it was over with, it, uh, he never called again. I remember going to a party with this girl that we were good friends, um, sort of semi-dated. And there was a guy there that zoomed in on me and started sort of harassing me because he knew I was 
gay, of course I didn't know, but you know what I mean? And it, it got to be a problem and I got real uncomfortable. And I remember going home and Jane walking me to my car. And I remember I broke down and cried. And it was almost like, that's when I really knew. And that's, and she knew, she knew all along too, but nothing was ever said. I always knew that I was different. I would hear guys talk about certain girls and what beautiful legs they had and uh, how when they had uh, on a tight sweater or something, uh, um, the curves of the girl's body. And uh, I just didn't relate to that. I thought I should. Um, what was it about that girl that made her so appealing to these guys? I was a late bloomer, to say the least. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. And I didn't know I didn't know until I went off to the women's college at 18. I dated, you know, I dated men. But I knew about 15 or 16, I was what you would call now very depressed, didn't know why. I do now. Gay people who are always the bad people are the tragic people. That reinforced the, the, uh, the fact that I, I could not possibly be attracted to same-sex individuals. I grew up thinking I was the only person like this, and everything I knew about the subject was bad. There was a lot of um, intense religious background in my family, and, um, and um, so many things were, were sinful, you know, from alcohol to sex was hardly even mentioned. I never, I never had the talk with my parents. Um, just kind of figure it out on your own. And when you figured out that you weren't the kind of person they expected you to be, that was really, that was difficult. Back when um, uh, I told my father I was going to law school, he quickly said that I would make a fine judge because he says, you do not show emotion in your face. And um, I uh, did not understand it then or did not try to understand it. Uh, but years later, I understood that it's because I've been an actor most of my life. My high school sweetheart, my high school girlfriend, she was ready to, to marry me no matter what. And uh, I had told her years before, while we were in high school, I told her that there was a secret that I had that only God knew. And during that weekend, while we were together, she said, what was that secret that you told me about that only you and God shared? And I told her. They were a group of thing, people you call queen beaters. If they knew you were gay, they would beat you up. There was a carload of boys next to us yelling, you know, Patty, what are you doing out there queer? And she called them a very unladylike word. And I told her, I said, you're going to get us killed. You're just absolutely going to get me killed. And it wasn't two minutes after that till this car cut me off. And this guy got out and just beat the hell out of me. I had a busted lip, broken nose, black eye. It's the only time. That's the only time because I didn't let my sister ride in my car anymore. <laughs> oh, my mother threw a fit. I'm going to find him. I said, well, you go, girl, because I'm not going to look for him. And she went and got the constable, and they went to the kid's house, and his car was still warm. He'd just gotten home. They wouldn't do a thing. The constable didn't do a thing. It was just another queer beaten up. What difference did it make? I did get jumped on by some college students at this. I was walking down the street, and this car 
came behind me, and a bunch of dudes called me a faggot. I told him I wasn't no faggot. And then I picked up me a brick and, and hit, it hit the car. So they got after me. I got my teeth knocked out, two of my teeth. How did the police uh, handle the whole incident? They handled it like I was homosexual. I had to go to jail and the boys get out. I'm sure I was not the only person at Sullins having a relationship with another young woman. And when, in the second year that I was there, the, um, the patrol caught me in another uh, woman's room and said, you have to go before the council and all of this stuff because this, this isn't done. And I thought to myself, what's the matter with these people? You know, this is just somebody I love. I didn't designate it anything, but so naive, you know. And they said, now, if you keep this up, you'll be uh, discharged from this facility. Well, it didn't stop me. I just got more secretive. I was an elementary school teacher my entire career, 40 years. I loved every minute I taught. But you, you did, I ha had to hide being gay, you know. I stayed away, uh, you know, I, I didn't socialize with school people as little as possible, unless it was very important to go. I rarely went to anything. My longtime companion always said, the only place to be gay is in the bedroom. Don't, don't display your orientation. He knew of other officers who had been not as careful as he had been, and they ended up without a pension, without a, an honorable discharge. They were ruined as far as their military careers were concerned. I just remember, you know, just being very closeted and very hidden. But some of us were so butchy looking, you know, you, you just, you, you know, you just knew. If women lived with one another. Uh, roommates, your roommate, housemate. I very rarely talked about my home life, rarely. I'd change the subject. I would ask questions of other people, you know, I'd make them carry the conversation. I, I knew how to do that well. I, I was just, marking time, just waiting, getting through it. I was so very confused about my own identity. Um, and then I read Kerouac's On the Road and decided, oh my God, there is a place. Maybe there's a place where I will fit in and belong. So I hitchhiked to California. I dated one girl in particular that I was very much in love with, but we never did anything sexually. Uh, I don't know whether it was because I was scared to, to, to do anything. Was I still hiding something? I, I knew something was different. I was living uh, a life that was acceptable to every outside observer, and I felt that I did not exhibit any um, affectations that might give me away. I had to catch the bus. At that time, the bus shelter was across from the War Memorial Building. And I was approached by a man that was in the bathroom. It was enough to, for me to know that this is what I was, what I was meant to be. And in the meantime, I was also going with Donna. And, and uh, but I kept migrating back. I kept going back. And, and, and then I realized that I had to make, I, I knew that I didn't want to ruin her life. I knew this was gonna be my life. I knew this was gonna be me. And I didn't want to ruin her life. And so that's when I, I told her that I was gay. I had a student visit me and tell me that he had agreed to room with this student. 
and that he wanted out of it. He said that he didn't want to hurt the student's feelings, but this student was a queer. And that, uh, and that therefore, uh, uh, he didn't want to live with him. Before I could make up my mind how to deal with this, he came back and uh, he said that not to worry about it, that he had taken care of it himself. So I knew that there were allegations against the student that he was gay or same sex. And so uh, it was, I think, the next year that he fell from the dormitory. Someone ran into my office and said uh, that a person had fallen from Carmichael tire number three. And so I ran out of my office and I found this student on the sidewalk and uh, uh, he had fallen from the 10th floor and he was pretty much torn up. And I looked into his eyes and the color had gone from his eyes and I knew that he was dead. What could I have done to have saved that student? The first uh, uh, Gay Pride March was a rather jarring public announcement of people whose uh, sexual orientation was uh, thereafter a matter of an open book. And, uh, and yet I knew people, I knew individuals before that who were gay, who were openly gay, uh, who uh, were just who they were. And I, you know, I, I think I had a certain amount of tolerance, uh, but that was, you know, that cost me nothing. Uh, they were who they were, and I believe in live and let live, and so I, I didn't have any feel. The real test for me came when, within my own family, I, one of my sons turned out to be gay. But when it's your own family, uh, it's a whole different set of questions. And you suddenly your own, it affects you personally. You think, how am I going to explain this? How am I going to uh, uh, come to the point where I'm not uncomfortable with this? How am I gonna deal with this? My folks came to visit us and my partner for those 38 years, he moved out. He moved out of the apartment for a while while they were there because he was that self-conscious about things. And I didn't want him to, but he, he said, it's, this is the only way I'll feel comfortable while your folks are here. And so that's the way it went. We, we, um, my sister-in-law later on, uh, I was riding, she was riding in the car with me by ourselves and she is the one member of our family that I really felt I could speak to frankly. And so I told her, I said, I guess you know that Al and I or a couple, we're gay. And she said, oh yes, I knew that all along. <laughs> and so from then on, I could talk freely with her. And um, she said, everybody in the family considers you a couple. And there's no need to, to feel ashamed. I know that people older than me had it much worse than I did. I'm talking about a gay relationship or gay world. And people now have it so much easier, but there's still a whole lot of hate and misunderstanding and anger. It was only after I reached the age of 47 um, and uh, began to, uh, uh, to exert my own free will in the matter, even though it was not openly gay, overt at that time. Still, I began to follow my own reasoning. Uh, it was then that, uh, that I blossomed uh, in terms of myself 
And it was then that I did the most good for the community, I think. I'm comfortable with myself and I'm comfortable where I am and I'm comfortable to be whatever, whatever the future holds is, I'm at a good place, so. And that took some time getting to, too. And that doesn't mean that the things that I was taught years and years and years ago don't pop into my mind sometimes, but the overriding thing is that if God's out there, he knows me, and, and I don't think he condemns me. I think he made me. I feel that I, transsexual is something I was, uh, it was a matter of going through puberty, I suppose. We all transition, yeah, we all, go, and I transitioned. And so I know there is, uh, there is a lot of discussion both in the community and outside about all of our labels and how we do self-identify. I think of myself as just a woman. I went to Westlake Clinic uh, July 7th, 1962. And that's when, I, that's when I began living. In my estimation, that's when I was born. Being different does not mean being better or worse is part of the variety and the spice of life. Just like apples fall off a tree and lots of them never come to maturity and some are sour and some are sweet, some are red and some are green, they're apples. And there's a certain percentage of them that will always be different. And that's what I think I have come to appreciate as an adult with the help of my son and the rest of my family, uh, that that's a welcome thing in our lives. It's very altogether positive. I attended a, a party in Nashville recently, uh, and there were kids there, and there was lots of straight people. It was, it was really, afterwards, I thought, this is just so amazing, and just the, the you know, the years that I can, everybody was just comfortable and nothing, nothing, none of that mattered. And that was just so uplifting. After, it was not as much while it was happening as after I reflected back on it, I thought, this is change and this is so good. And that, that just made me feel good. I, I can't imagine really what the next 50 years will be like.